Hi, it's Dr. Noel Robert Williams, Optimal Health Associates, March 26, 2020. Sorry for anyone who was a little disappointed I didn't do one yesterday, but now and then everybody needs a break, even, <laughs> and I'm sure many people from me. So um, we're back and I'll be back for the next several days, at least in a row. Um, so uh, I'm gonna update everyone on COVID. I have um, a little bit of statistical stuff that I posted last night that I'll go over in detail. Uh, and I'll go over current trends in the United States and the rest of the world. I do have a little funny story. I, I still don't have my results. I feel fine. Um, but I did uh, have Quest Lab call me or get a hold of me today to want to know, what, to confirm all my billing information. I was more interested in my results. They were more interested in my billing information. So that was kind of funny to me that here I'm nine days from the test, 10 days from day of test. and. No results, it's in LA sitting there, but they want their money to be able to bill me, even though I'm not getting any results. And that's kind of what shows um, how screwed up our system is, I think. I mean, I hear I'm a private practice physician in a great group of outstanding doctors, and um, the system, there's something wrong with it. And we will eventually get to that at some point in the future, but. Um, it's just kind of interesting that we still can't get results of tests here unless you happen to be a celebrity or a politician or an athlete uh, for the most part quickly. And that's a little disturbing too. And I think that's pretty disturbing to the rest of the country because that's how it's been, that those people get results very quickly and maybe we need to even that out or start a populist revolution about care that everyone gets good care and not if you're just a special person. But anyway, um, let's talk about COVID. So COVID cases now, we're the number one country in the world. We have 82,000 cases. Uh, we have 200 and about 50 cases roughly in Oklahoma and seven deaths. Uh, we have, I think about 1,400 deaths or maybe a little bit less. Um, nationally, it's somewhere between 1,200 and 1,400. Sometimes the numbers begin to blur. So our overall death rate's 1.4%. So that's uh, good news. So has there been this sudden increase in cases in the United States? There were 17,000 positives over the last 24 hours. No, all of these cases have been going on. This entire thing is the failure of the CDC to have a testing kit that worked. And because of that, now that we're actually gonna be testing, we're gonna have huge jumps every single day. So don't be surprised if by this time next week we're at somewhere in the range of 200 or 250,000 infected, or I wouldn't say infected people, but people who have had the virus. But now that's what we need to talk about because some really, really interesting statistical analysis came out from both Italy and France yesterday and also some genomic or genetic data on the virus, which has made me feel tremendously better. And it needs to make all of us feel tremendously better. But it also means that later, when we're through this, we need to hold the CDC and the National Institute of Health accountable and our government accountable because the reason we're all flummoxed is their complete and total failure. So let me explain what's going on. The, I, the current or prior to this recent data, everyone was thinking that probably one in three to maybe one in four people who got infected with uh, corona or COVID-19 would be symptomatic. And that was kind of the standard thought process for this disease. Well, as the data has started to come out, um, we're seeing a big change. And this big change is, out of France and Italy, it looks like of for every infected person, there's 10, inf or excuse me, for every infected person who's symptomatic, there's 10 infected people who are not symptomatic at all. And so that is a massive statistical change and it's importance, I can't emphasize its importance because what it means is ultimately, this disease is super infectious, we knew that. And so it's gonna disseminate in the population very quickly. But the fact that the vast majority of people are asymptomatic also means rather quickly, the vast majority of people will have immunity, which is a huge change. Because the original data looking at viral modeling on death rates in the United States were between 1 million best case scenario and 3 million to 4 million worst case scenario. So let's do some simple numbers. So 
well, they're not really st simple in statistics. It's never really simple, but I'll try to make it understandable. Um, but if you're a statistician walking, watching me, I'm sure you could have done it better. But if there's 375 million people in the United States, let's assume that 80% get infected with this virus. There's always going to be a group with any plague type event who just don't get it no matter what. And we'll say that's 20%. So 80% of us get it. So there's 375 million of us, 300 million of us get it. But instead of a third of us becoming symptomatic, it turn, which would be 100 million, it looks like it's only gonna be 10%, which is 30 million. And then if you look at that group, only about 10% are gonna get more significantly ill and probably require hospitalization. So that gets to be 3 million. And then once you start looking at some changes with, uh, with treatment strategies, which I'll go back to, but ultimately out of that 3 million, probably about 1.5 million people need a ventilator, which is a ton of humans. It's a ton of humans. And about half of those people could die, which is about 750,000. So the first thing to realize with just this very brief analysis, we've gone from you know 1.2 to 3.5 million all the way down to 750,000 potential deaths. But then we have to start adding some other factors in. That was all based on data without thinking about Plaquenil. Plaquenil looks like it's gonna lower the effective severe disease rate by 90%, which is huge. So it may not be that high and it's gonna take some, some period of time to roll it out, but ultimately that's gonna reduce the morbidities, meaning a bunch of sick people going into the intensive care units and a bunch of people dying then massively. And hopefully that should get us to well under 100,000. Now, again, I don't know. I don't know. But when you look at statistics, you have to program it in. What does it all mean? And, and so I think the summary from this initial change is the whole disease process, while still terrible and horrible and rotten, is going to be much less devastating to the whole country than it was originally thought to be. Now, when we're talking about numbers, we have to remember numbers relate to people and people have families. And, and you, you have to remember too, the 100,000 people or so who could die from this, um, that is a catastrophic event for those people and their families. And I'm not belittling it, but at some point you have to, when you're me, get your mind around it at, in terms of a number. Otherwise, you become incapacitated emotionally. And those people who are watching this who know me know I'm an emotional person, so I have to kind of keep it a little bit objective in order to stay sane and not start crying in front of everyone. So I think that's a positive. The second positive data set that came out was there's only, turns out, five genetic mutations that are recurring repeatedly with the virus as it's going through the population. None of those five genetic mutations appear to be clinically significant, nor will they impact uh, vaccine development. That's amazingly positive data also, which means that one, First, if you happen to get the virus, you're probably gonna have long-term immunity or a higher chance of long-term immunity. Number two, since the parts of the virus that are changing aren't that important genetically, it makes the vaccine easier to make and it will make the vaccine last. So one vaccine could protect you against coronavirus for years and years and years. And if this genetic modeling doesn't change, forever. So we have some good news, even though it's still scary news, but some very good news on the actual pandemic event and then the long-term vaccine data. Now, the problem with all of this is the next two months are gonna be very difficult. They're gonna be very difficult in large cities and it's gonna be a disaster because it's gonna come down to, if you're in Oklahoma, and there's 3 million people and 10% or we'll say 80% get infected, it's 2.4 million, 10% get reasonably sick, that's, you know, um, or I'm sorry, 10% get symptomatic, that's 240,000, 10% of that group gets sick, that's 24,000, and 5% need ventilators, that's 12,000, 
if you're in New York City where there's eight or nine million people and it's 80% um, get infected, that's 7.2 million, and 720,000 of those get pretty sick, and 360,000 need ventilators over the next three or four months, it's a huge problem compared to 12,000. I mean, we'll have our challenges with 12,000, but 12,000 uh, respiratory patients in Oklahoma is easier to manage than you know, 360,000 ventilator patients in New York City. And so we have some advantages here, and plus you don't wanna underestimate the fabulous care that someone like David Chansom can do, who's the infectious disease doctor of Integris, who was all over this, and all these fabulous critical care physicians at all these hospitals, and there are too many to name, and they're brilliant and gifted and motivated, and the hospital administrators are too, and so they're gonna be very creative on making sure Oklahomans get taken care of. But the bottom line is we shouldn't get to the level of overwhelmness that some of these other big cities are going to be. We're gonna be overwhelmed, but it's gonna be a more manageable overwhelmed, um, I hope, than some of these big cities. And there's not a lot we can do about that. It's just number of people in a confined space. So this uh, rendition of my review may seem a little odd, but I actually feel a lot better about COVID-19 looking at this new data. I still understand there's a horrible three months ahead, or four months ahead of us, but I don't think it's gonna be a horrible six months and I don't think it's gonna be a horrible year or two. I think it's gonna be better. We just have to get through this. We need to take our zinc, we need to take our melatonin. Don't forget your melatonin, it interrupts the inflammatory cascade. And then with the Plaquenil availability increasing all the time and the acceptance, even at the FDA level a little bit more, because it's obvious and hard to deny, um, I think we're gonna be in really good shape. So that's the summary for the 26th. Um, some of the statistics are better. I think the, the potential for vaccines is much higher to have success. And I think in Oklahoma, in particular, we're in a, a really good place. But if you're not in Oklahoma, just remember, there are highly motivated doctors wherever you are. Um, it's our moment as physicians to care for you, and God willing, each of us should, and the nurses, and the respiratory techs, and the guys who take care, and the gals who take care of the ventilators. This is our moment to step up and feel worthwhile, so I think we all will. Um, take care, and good night.